Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you like every Tuesday joining me in front of my, you know, fireplace in Miami, probably the only fireplace in Florida. Uh, haven't used it since I've moved in, obviously, uh, and probably won't use it <laughs> for the next few decades. Uh, today, I'm, I'm actually very, very excited because we have, a, you know, a very esteemed guest, a good friend of mine, Terry Heyman, which I mean, we were just before I opened this, uh, this conversation, we were just recalling good memories of, of of breakfast and dinners and drinks in London. So that was a that was a, a good conversation. Hi Terry, how are you doing today? How are I'm you doing? very well, thank you. Nice to see you, Remy, and thank you so much for inviting me on today. No, it's my pleasure. I mean, we have a lot of things to talk about. I mean, I'm very interested in with uh, you know what the World Bull Council has done for the few year a few years back to, to today, and especially with the responsible gold mining principle that you recently released. I mean, we're going to have a lot to, to talk about. I, I just want to mention right away also to uh, to our attendees that as always, this is meant to be as interactive as possible. I always have my eyes on, on, on the chat. So if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to try to grab it and put inside the conversation so that Terry can give us his perspective, both as a, you know, mining industry veteran. Gosh, I make you sound like a 65 year old. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> also, you're going to hate me before the end of this chat. You're going to see. But anyway, uh, and from the World Gold Council also. So please do feel free to, to do so, um, to, to, uh, to ask any question. Uh, as always, little tradition that we have here, it's not my, my, my favorite, but uh, for the first, uh, you know, two minutes, I'm going to use that time just to make uh, our, our little, you know, present our disclaimer. Uh, so basically, the opinion expressed by today's panelists, so that would be lovely Terry here, are their personal views and may not reflect the views of the organization that they represent. Whenever possible, AMI has verified the accuracy of the information provided by third parties but does not under any circumstances accept responsibility for any inaccuracies should they remain unverified. It is expected that webinar attendees will use the information provided in this webinar in conjunction with other information and with sound management practices. AMI therefore will not assume responsibility for commercial loss due to business decisions made based on the use or non-use of the information provided in today's webinar. So not only is it very dry to read, but you had to understand you know, my French accent, which hasn't improved since last week. And I don't plan to have any, any, any improvement in the near future. Um, but as I was saying, first of all, thank you for joining us. You, you probably all know already about America's market intelligence with a lot of you know, counterparty risk assessment or uh, advising to mining companies for social license to operate, a series of, of understanding, especially of above the grand risks. Uh, we also have AFMI, Africa Market Intelligence, that now covers also, you know, 36 out of 54 countries in Africa. So still a little way to go, but usually the most important countries. Um, and so that, that's for AMI. Uh, let me just maybe turn to, to Terry. I'm going to ask you a very hard question, Terry. Maybe for some, I don't think there's any, but that don't know about the World Gold Council. Can you just tell us first a little description of the World Gold Council? I told you that's going to be Hard question. I don't shy away from the hard questions. Go for it. Well, of course, very, very happy to. And, and Remy, let me just say again, thank you for having me. And, and look, it's so nice to have a conversation with somebody and it's uh, one, one on one. And, and of course, welcome everybody else who's, who's listening in. But it's a very different experience when you're sat here one on one with, with everybody listening in. And you, you've been good and got your coffee. I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm, I'm already significantly through the day. I'm, I'm in London. So look, the World Gold Council is the, the market development organization for the gold industry. We really exist to make sure that gold continues to be relevant in today's world and that people understand the role that gold can play. So we are a, a membership association. Our, our members are the world's leading gold mining companies, 26 um, of the world's leading gold mining companies, names you'll, you'll recognize, uh, some of the biggest miners in the world like Barrick and Newmont, Anglo Gold Ashanti, to some smaller companies. And, and just recently, Hummingbird Resources joined uh, a smaller producer operating out in, in West Africa. And all of our members share a commitment that gold plays a, an important role in today's world. That gold has, has played a role, that gold is well understood for thousands of years. People often ask me, Terry, why does the World Gold Council need to exist? Everybody knows what gold is and, and what gold is about. And that is true. Um, there are very few people who are not familiar with gold. I think what's changing is societal expectations around the role that gold can play, how gold is used as a store of value. And we're seeing that at the moment, that play out very strongly. And also this broader question as to what, what is the, the role that gold mining companies play? And a lot of the recent work that, that I've led has, has been talking to that element around responsible mining and what does that mean? And, and why is the mining industry important in when responsibly undertaken, contributing to sustained socio and economic development in the countries and communities 
that, that are fortunate enough to have gold reserves in, in the ground. And Remy, you've done a lot of work in that area and are familiar with that. So look, we, we're based out of London, um, but really very global in our, in our intent. We do quite a lot of policy work, engaging with uh, the policymakers about the design of markets, uh, gold markets, in particular in, in China and in India, the world's two largest gold demand markets. Gold in both of those countries and indeed most of Asia is predominantly bought in the form of jewellery, but in many ways it's wearable bullion and it's a store of value. We've got an office in New York, a lot of connection with the institutional investor marketplace, um, as well as we sponsor a couple of gold ETFs. Uh, and then we just engage globally on issues that are related to the gold market. No, absolutely. I mean, in, in case you have the chance, like I have from time to time, to talk to Terry and, and have an open conversation. I mean, I've had so many you know, interesting conversations on the importance of gold and the vision from different societies. I remember one conversation we had specifically on jewelry in India and the importance of how, you know, especially in gender relations, in issues of you know, tradition, societies, how the perception of gold and the, and the role that gold plays into maintaining some societal structure or potentially moving forward in one direction or another is very different from one country to, to the next. And I think that that's something that you know, we sometimes tend to be you know, very much focused. If you're a junior miner, you focus on your exploration and drilling campaigns. If you're an investor, you focus on, on, the, on the stock exchange and other, other elements. Uh, but I think, you know, if, if you, when we talk to people from the World Gold Council, there's this comprehensive vision of, of what gold means and how the sector itself should be reformed, improved, uh, and, and could be, you know, integrating a series of different variables. And one of these, you know, transitioning to, uh, to the issue of sustainability, obviously we're seeing across the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the industry a push towards more sustainability in terms of, of sourcing minerals, in terms of ensuring transparency of supply chains. Uh, it's been pushed by consumers, by the markets, by a series of, of norms. Uh, and I know obviously we are bridging to, the, to the, uh, the, the responsible gold mining principle, but this is not the first initiative that the World Gold Council takes. Can you actually give us a little bit of, of a perspective of, of a series of different you know, indexes and, 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 uh, and, and guidelines to encourage for sustainability in the gold sector, please? Of course. So a few thoughts on that, Remy, and speaking to that connectedness, if you like, across the entirety of the gold supply chain. Look, it's a privilege of working at the World Gold Council that we get to see that. And, and um, I, I've been at mines and, and, and been in, and seen at the, at the, the ore face where the gold is being extracted through to refiners and understanding the role that refiners play in this industry to spending time in not just in China and India, but probably particularly in China and India, given they are such important demand markets for gold, understanding the uh, mentality towards gold in, in both of those markets and how people think about gold, the role that gold plays in, in people's lives, um, and the fact that gold is so important in terms of financial security and financial resilience. And um, to me, that all comes together in this, uh, this idea around the gold markets contributing meaningfully to society. And it relies on and is underpinned by a sustainable gold mining industry. And so I think we're seeing across the board this, this questions around, and actually I think it's been exacerbated by COVID and pr prompts some interesting discussions, what is the role of business and how does business contribute and how does business make people's lives better? And I see that in the gold industry uh, across all parts of the gold supply chain. So look, in answer to your question, let me give a little bit of a background of some of the specific initiatives that, that we've worked on at the World Gold Council. Um, and again, what, what we do is predominantly looking at demand for gold and thinking about who's buying gold, why they're buying gold, how that changes over time. Um, I was on a call earlier today just talking about changing uh, retail um, consumer demand for, for retail jewellery uh, in, in India and how, as all over the world, uh, children don't want to do the same thing their parents did, want to create their new traditions and what that means. And, and it's interesting just in this broader perspective. But although the vast majority of our focus is on demand, we've recognised for a number of years that there is, as you say, this increasing question around sustainability around uh, responsible business uh, and responsible sourcing and what that means in the gold context because um, I, I spent a little bit of time in, in Florida and certainly in the UK and many other places you go into your supermarket and you go and buy fresh produce and you get a lot of information now as to where that comes from and how it's been produced and is it organic or is it produced like this 
And similar I, I, questions I, I, I are asked. I thought you were going to say. I, I thought you were going to say there was a lot of gold in Florida, but that's much more into the supermarket and the, and the stores, much more than in, in, in the ground here. But that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I think it's a, just an interesting perspective to yes. look at this broader question around responsible sourcing and responsible business practices and expectations on what we know about where our goods and and, and come from and and the the path that they've taken to to reach us. And you're right, consumer interest is increasing across the board um, probably different sectors at different pace I'm happy to talk about that but we're also seeing that increasing interest now particularly across the investor community and investors understanding um, then we go back to our path so our path really started back in um, 2010 2011 when there were questions starting to be asked around gold as it related to severe human rights abuses and, and um, particularly in, in regard to serious issues of conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, I think everybody, you're certainly, I'm sure everybody on the call will be familiar with concerns around diamonds and blood diamonds and some of the developments that had happened there. And some of these questions were starting to be asked around gold and, and, and other minerals um, with a particular focus, but not limited to the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we were asked by our members and i'd stress it really is a, a member-led organization it's a ceo-led organization our board comprises pretty much the ceos of all our member companies and very much under their direction we looked at what the gold mining industry should be doing to address concerns related to these severe human rights abuses and, and, and serious conflict and that led to in 2012 us putting out the conflict-free gold standard which is the first industry-led approach to defining how you operate a business responsibly in conflict-affected areas. That's important because the gold industry finds itself, as you well know, in at the frontier often. Um, it is an industry that, that goes into where, where the reserves are, and that often means going into higher risk jurisdictions and, and figuring out how you do that in a responsible manner. But crucially, and, and this really underpinned the work on the conflict-free gold standard and it underpins work continuing today on responsible gold mining where you can go and make a positive difference you, you should do that because so many of these countries and communities need that economic activity need that capital brought in need the skills to be able to develop and, and, and transform their economy so the conflict-free gold standard was really the, the starting point in many ways for us and we, we went through a very extensive consultation process. It was linked into some of the international efforts that were going on at the time. The OECD in particular has, was doing and is continuing to do a lot of work around responsible sourcing. I'm happy to come back and talk on that if you've got more questions. The other big initiative that we've, we've looked at and, and done and probably people on this call will be familiar with, and it comes at a bit of a different angle, but I think it's very complementary, is again, at the direction and instigation really from our members looking at accounting for gold mining and how to develop metrics that speak to the economics of gold mining in a way that um, communicates clearly and, and consistently the costs associated with gold mining and so that led to us in uh, 2013 i think putting out the this guidance note on all in costs and all in sustaining costs and you'll be aware and that very quickly gained traction across the marketplace uh, and that um, it's unusual nowadays to find a gold mining company that doesn't report using all in sustaining costs and, and sometimes all in costs as well and really the driver for that was to help better communicate costs associated with gold mining it's a really important part of the overall sustainability agenda to be able to explain where the value goes to be able to explain the costs associated with gold mining and to have proper grown-up conversations about how those that value should be equitably distributed across governments across the the shareholders in, in companies uh, across others who are involved in in managing to produce gold employees community representatives others so yes it's a it's an accounting metric it's a non-gap accounting metric let me be very clear it's non-gap mm -hmm. um but I think that has helped provide additional transparency into the economics of gold mining. And to me, that's part of this overall, um, overall mission around helping build trust and confidence in the gold mining sector. And, and the sustainability angle is a very important part of that. It comes with 
understanding what these companies are doing, how they're operating, um, how they communicate both their impact and their economics to the people they're engaged with so that they can do what they're, they're about, which is making a return for shareholders whilst at the same time benefiting all of those other stakeholders that are involved in the gold mining process. Absolutely. And I, I, I love your answer, but at the same time, it puts me a, a series of problems. I have 17 follow-up questions with what you actually wrote to the- Great. To the We've got time. I've got time. So guys, we have five hours of coffee chat, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, the idea, you mentioned the importance of, of investors looking into it, and we do see it. I mean, the investors that we work with, they, they look at reputational impact, obviously, but more than anything, they also understood that, you know, without sustainability, without mitigation above the grand risk, the projects do not move forward. If you can't get the social license to operate, then the, 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 the capacity for an investor to have an interesting return on investment is, is that much, much limited. You mentioned issues of, of very specific areas. Uh, I think what's very important with the responsible gold mining principle is that it gives guidelines when you actually work on formalization processes, for example, within formal miners, when you try to make the separation between, let's say, formal industrial regulated mining with criminal organization backed and formal miners. And I, and I do realize there's a large gap in between, obviously. Uh, and so those are, those are elements that I think if we have time, we can probably you know, touch upon a little more. But I'm interested into the structure of the RGMP themselves. I mean, obviously, you, you, you built uh, your decision on, on, on integrating inside the RGMP uh, the sustainable development goal. I'm coming from the United Nations world, very originally doing my PhD, so I was a fan of this, obviously. But what was the logic when you actually integrated those RGMP? What was the main objective? And, and then potentially, how do you track it down afterwards and assess the feasibility and the implementation of it? That's a long question, I realize it. No, 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 it's not, <laughs> not, not as long as my answers, Remy. So, <laughs> look, um, the background to the, to the responsible gold mining principles, uh, to some extent, it builds on some of the earlier initiatives we've done. And look, there, there are more things we've done in the past, um, but, but those are probably the two most meaningful in terms of building industry-wide approaches that the entirety of the sector gets on board with and says, yep, this helps us, this is the right thing to do, it helps us to uh, achieve good practice and to measure ourselves against others, but it also helps us as an industry to better communicate collectively what we're doing and, and what we're about. In September 2017, uh, we had a board meeting, again, CEOs from our member companies, and there was a discussion around, look, we as an industry feel that we're, we're doing a lot around sustainability. Um, could we be doing more? Maybe but we're doing a lot, but we're not, not able to, um, to articulate effectively all that we're doing and to communicate what constitutes responsible gold mining. Investors come to us and say, okay, I, I can see the conflict-free gold standard and that's great, but that just addresses issues around human rights and conflict. What about environmental issues? What about governance? We see things like the cyanide code that's been around for a long time and is in the gold sector really important given the, the use of cyanide really important in terms of managing cyanide effectively which is a material risk and for, for gold miners um, but that's just one aspect how do we as, as investors and as other stakeholders know what we should be looking for asking what actually defines responsible gold mining in, in the totality and so what we did and the board asked Gary Goldberg, who at the time was the CEO of Newmont, to oversee this initiative on, on behalf of our board. We got together a task force of representatives from member companies, and we put in what we thought were the material issues that speak to responsible gold mining. We went out, we consulted very widely on that. Um, so we put out an initial draft. We went and did a lot of external consultation. Very grateful to everybody who participated in that. There might be some people on the call who were involved in that process had lots of bilaterals. We also were fortunate enough that a number of institutions hosted round table discussions for us across five continents, um, including organizations like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, some leading think tanks in South Africa, um, some outreach in, in, in Asia. And they went back to the drawing board, put another, that through the hopper again, again with member input and, and learning, did another round of, of draft and consultation. And eventually two years on, September, 2019, put out this document. Now, I, I think that there are a few areas where we have 
move the definition forward as to what constitutes responsible gold mining and can talk about those artisanal and small scale mining and the relationship between large scale and artisanal is, is one area. But in large part, what we have done and, and um, we make no bones about it and we're very clear is to pull out existing good practice, best practice across all of these different standards and codes that exist and put it in one document that is very accessible and if anybody hasn't already gone and taken a look at this, please do. It's up on our website that really makes it an organizing framework. And that is really what it is. It's an organizing framework grouped under environmental, social and governance. We actually chose in the, in the way we've set this up to start with the governance, because we think if you can't get your governance right, how do you manage environmental and social and sets out at the highest level, 10 themes, 10, 10 overarching themes that, that speak to um, in each of environmental, social and governance, what a responsible gold mining company should do. Uh, and then under each of those themes, a number of sub themes so that there are 51 principles in total. Again, that to us is this organizing framework that defines everything that should be considered material to running a responsible gold mining company. That was released in September 2019 last year, where sort of six, seven months on now, probably a little bit more, I'm losing track. All of our members have committed to implement this. We can talk more about that process, um, but we really hope that this again will become very widespread across the gold mining industry beyond just the members of the World Gold Council. So, so looking at it from the perspective of, of, of mining companies and, and government, uh, when they're looking at, at those RGMPs, I'm trying to assess the role of each one, obviously the mining companies is to mainstream inside the con that they're the operations and, and, and report it and be able to you know, gain this, this label of, of sustainability. What would be the role from, from maybe governmental actors? I'm asking because you, you mentioned you know, people maybe listening. I just realized we have two ministers of mines in the attendance right now. So one from Latin America, one from Africa. So there's definitely an interest into you know, RGMP. Uh, how can we, you know, what, what is in terms of your conversation with key ministerial actors or, uh, or, or key economic actors that might not be also from the mining sector, but might be take a play in terms of the political you know, framework of mining or the regulatory framework of mining. What is, how do you work with them and what is your views on how you could implement better those RGMPs through the mining companies? Look, it's a great question and, and thank you. And I think um, we have worked on and developed the RGMPs with a very wide range of stakeholders. To, for mining to be successful, it needs the support and engagement of, of a broad group of stakeholders and the government has to be involved, communities, near and far from the mine site have to be involved, uh, employees, investors. What I think the RGMPs does, well, let me just back up a moment. Um, I said earlier, we have a very firm belief at the World Gold Council, and, and I know this is shared by our members, that when gold mining is undertaken responsibly, it has the potential to drive significant and sustained social and economic development. And the mining industry can and should be a partner in supporting social and economic development in those communities and countries where, where they operate. Now, a really important condition of that is those mines operate responsibly. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about that and can talk more to that. One of the questions that always comes up is what does that mean? And for mines and mining companies to be able to demonstrate to their local stakeholders, including governments, what they are doing, how they are putting management systems and processes in place around responsible operating and vice versa, how governments can hold them to account. Having this organizing framework that very clearly sets out, as I said, 10 overarching themes, 51 individual principles that enables that dialogue and the conversation, I think is really meaningful. And I think governments should be going to any gold producer and asking them whether they're implementing this, how they're implementing it, what it means in terms of what they're doing. And it's a great basis for a conversation where you can very clearly go, yeah, that's important, that's important, that's important, and have a structured conversation around what a mining company is doing to uh, proactively manage these, these issues. It helps, I think, uh, bridge the sometimes the, the Sometimes they're great conversations. Sometimes there, there has been potentially been a lack of conversations or for whatever reasons, the conversations haven't gone off as, as, as best as they could. This is a very simple and, and we hope accessible 
Now, there's a lot of detail behind all of this. So when I talk about its simplicity and accessibility, don't get me wrong that it's kind of uh, superficial. It's not. The responsible goal mining principles are quite accessible. They're widely available in, in a range of different languages. It provides a great basis for conversation. There's a lot more underpinning it in terms of the assurance process. And, and I should have mentioned earlier, all companies who implement the RGMPs are required to publicly disclose their conformance to get external assurance on that. It really is designed to provide that additional confidence that it's not just a company saying we're doing this, it's somebody's really gone in and robustly checked that that is the case. And, and there's a, a, a good amount of underlying supporting uh, documentation around that. But at its core, this is a pretty simple list of 51 things that any gold mining company should be doing, should be able to demonstrate how they are proactively managing that and engage in conversations that support, that just go back to this idea of supporting responsible mining, driving sustained social and economic development. Uh, we, we, thank you very much. We, we had a, already a question on, 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 by the way, community relations. I, I'll address it just afterwards. I just wanted to do a follow-up first question on what you were saying. Um, from the mining company, when, when talking about reporting the results, I mean, obviously we, we interact on a daily basis. You do also with mining companies as, as two, three people that do a lot of reporting. How do they not feel that it's just another reporting on top of the ones that they were doing before? And, and how has it changed and how is it different? I already have the answer, but I want to ask you first. Now, I, I want I mean, to- you said, you said it was only going to be easy questions. <laughs> so here's, here's the tough question, which is I think a lot of things that people might want to know. If you want to gain the confidence and if you want to make sure that you know, the reporting is actually uh, in line with the reality on the ground and includes a series of different perceptions, not only the one from the industry, uh, what about you know third party assessment and making sure that you know we, we know a lot of indexes that are very good and say the responsible mining foundation index but that's self-reporting a lot of those are self-reporting you know we're doing on the ground a series of our own you know assessment for, with you know different local universities or different and how do we bridge that gap so that either the small pilot project that some of people like us are doing become a little more established and can really serve as a check-in balances for mining companies that do this in the best ways, in the constructive ways. And how do we make sure that people opposing mining do not just say, oh, this is self-reporting. You see what you see what I'm saying? It's all yours. And then we go to community relations and well, just a little warning ahead of time. <laughs> good, good. So, um, look, I, I, I was being a little bit flippant before. I think it's important to have proper discussions and, and hard questions and to yeah, yeah, of course, engage in, in, in those. And, and, and don't get me wrong on that. And, and the assurance piece is really important. And the assurance piece is quite candidly, what gets, sometimes gets our members going, oh, okay, there's a, there's a lot of work to do around that. And uh, how, how do we manage that? And how do we, uh, the, the, the mine general managers are already getting overwhelmed with the number of things that they need to do. So a few thoughts on that. Firstly, I think it's really important that there is this public disclosure and that you do have external assurance on it. It's, so. I should have said at the beginning, I, I've got a couple of different roles at the World Gold Council. In addition to leading our work on membership initiatives, I, I'm the CFO of the organization as well. We have to go through financial reporting. We get external assurance on financial reporting. The auditors come in, they kick the tires, they ask some difficult questions. They really look to see that what we are presenting in terms of our financial statements are correct and accurate and, and don't misrepresent the reality. And it's a... Um, yeah, it's an exercise that you have to be invested in and engaged in and, and commit to. But it absolutely is important, both in getting the confidence for our board that they know what's going on inside the organization, but also we learn things through that process. And, and that's right. And so I, I think um, there is a recognition across the industry that what we are used to and very used to in financial reporting and the assurance or the auditing you get around financial reporting is going to happen around sustainability or, or non-financial reporting. The, there's also recognition that that can bring value, that you can learn from that, that you find opportunities for performance improvements, that you potentially identify potential challenges down the road before those have materialized and there's a ton of value to be, a, to be attached to that. And, and I think a lot of companies are, have seen that and understand that and and value that. I think the really important element is to make sure that what we're not doing with the best within the world to the assurance community, it is creating 
work that doesn't have duplicative work that doesn't have any benefit and value that the assurance companies comes in and and do does things that is not value adding they're not really looking at what's happening uh, and or they're doing duplication because they're going through different approaches that are out there and providing assurance against both so we're doing quite a lot with our members but also the assurance community to make sure that the assurance is robust and at the same time the assurance is linked into existing assurance processes and the assurance can serve to improve performance ultimately and look let me just talk a little bit about the process we went through um, even before launching the responsible gold mining principles very aware of wanting to make sure that the assurance was was value adding to co implementing companies as well as to external stakeholders so we worked with the assurance community um, and we actually contracted with one of them to, to help us in developing the assurance framework to make sure that you can actually provide assurance against these principles that is a principles based approach um, we went with the, the uh, assurers to two mine sites two of our members very kindly volunteered to be pilots um, and they've been public about it so I can talk about it as well so Sabania Steelwater in South Africa okay. Sentara Gold in the Kyrgyz Republic and we actually went with a team of, of auditors of assurance providers and said here are the near finalized responsible gold mining principles if you were here on a live uh, assurance could you actually assure against this and that led to a few um, tweaks and changes because it's really important we want to know that when you invite an assurance provider to come and scrutinize you that they can come out of that and say yes you do conform or no you don't that really is is important and we want to make sure that process works so look i'm not sure that we, we will learn as we get more and more of the assurance undertaken how that process works and uh, there may be a need to refine or improve that i think that's true across the the, the board in terms of sustainability assurance and we're seeing more and more different types of, of sustainability reporting and assurance and we're all learning from it but it is a really important part of this overall approach so, so maybe something that would help with yes to the question from from carlos torres uh, carlos torres is one of the leading mining uh, lawyer in, in, in ecuador um, when you talk about assurance when you talk about you know be able to quantify you know potential impact it would have on investment and capacity for mining companies to, to make sure that they address issues of sustainability, probably through engineering, through, through environmental preservation and others. I think the question from Carlos is interesting because it actually relates to the relation with community. I'm just gonna read this question and encourage others to, uh, to ask questions they want to, because with Terry, I can spend five hours on autopilot talking about anything in the world related business. Uh, but here's a question from Carlos. How about what is now called the community permit, permiso de comunidad? which by the way relates to the community acceptance of the project, which has nothing or little to do with technical issues, but with people's perceptions on mining projects. Sometimes it read downs or, um, on political positions. What should be implemented to this new affair? It's true when you actually bring assurance companies, when you look at sustainability assurance, they can indeed look at you know, the quality of tailings, they can look at you know, the quality of processes inside the company, they can look at the issues of you know, technical and engineering matters. But when it comes to political acceptance and political in the large scope, how do those RGMPs tackle this issue of, of political acceptance? Uh, please fill it in. I, I, I died of, of, of desire to answer that question also. So please go for it first and then I can. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, and Remy, I would love to hear your views on, on that <laughs> as well. And, and, and look, I think, firstly, I would say that that concept and the, the recognition of having community acceptance is becoming increasingly important in the investor community. And it's becoming increasingly important because the investors realize if they want to be able to get a return on their investment, you, you need this, the, the support and, and uh, engagement of, of communities. We've, we've all seen and know examples of, of gold mines that haven't delivered their full potential because they haven't had the, the backing and support of, of communities. And I think that is translating itself into how companies engage and act and, and increasingly um, talk to what they are doing to win over and, and to at least engage with um, communities. What we've included in the Responsible Gold Mining Principles is, is not a sort of a tick, yes or no, do you have community acceptance? What we have done is, is talk to that in a few different places. So the first is under governance, we look at impact assessments and the degree to which, and, and just 
recognizing the need for companies to undertake impact assessments and to understand um, how they are going to, how their operations and activities do and, uh, and will impact on the communities uh, around a mine site. And that might be local, it might be further afield. Uh, and there are good reasons why sometimes further afield communities get in, impacted as well, transport routes and, and, and other things. Um, so that impact assessment and, and the fact that companies have undertaken an impact assessment and have used an impact assessment to inform the way they run their business is something that you as an external assurance provider can come in and, and look at. And then we have a whole section and that impact assessment isn't just around communities, but that's one area where, where this is covered. And then there is a whole theme around communities. And actually, I talked about these 10 themes and the underlying principles. We have more underlying principles under community than any other. So there are 10 themes. Community is one of them, sits under the social, uh, social pillar. Um, that there are more individual principles around community, which speaks to the importance that is given to community and the recognition of the different levels of, of the different needs to, to engage. And that includes issues um, like community engagement and what are the processes and a lot of this does look at management systems and management processes that are in place because those are observable and, and measurable um, but it also looks at issues like gender and diversity and, and what are companies doing to to engage um, with potentially historically underrepresented groups from the community and make sure that they are not just going to the first person from the community that puts their hands up and says, I am the community representative, you only need to listen to me, but that companies work a bit harder to understand different voices. Again, that is measurable. That's something that you can demonstrate what, what you have done. Um, and then looking at things like, and, and, and it links into uh, environmental and, and some of the harder, you talked about tailings before, what, what, are, what are companies doing around community response plans and emergency evacuation plans and the, the, the really unfortunate events from Brumadino and some of the learnings there around the, the, the failings around being able to alert the community in a, in a timely basis. So there are lots of individual aspects around engaging with community and preparedness with the community that are definitive steps that, got, that companies can take. Um, do we say do you have the political support of the community? No, that's a very hard thing to measure and it won't be a, a universal, or very rarely will there be a universal, everybody's in exactly the same place, not least because as humans we all, we all have different views on different things all the time, but the steps that mining companies can take and, and the importance they place in recognising that that engagement with the community is essential to help them give their licence to operate. But Remy, that, that's just sort of where, where I come from, my perspective. You, you've spent a lot of time looking at these issues and a lot of time on, on the ground and would be great uh, to hear your perspectives as well. Gosh, I, I, I taught about the topics for semesters and, and on the ground, so I, might, I, might, I, I don't know if I have time to put everything I want to say, but let me just address very, very quickly. Uh, first of all, the, the question on perception, political perception of mining versus, let's say, hard data engineering that can be quantified. Um, in any case, you can't, can only answer with perception uh, fears, concerns with some real scientific data. There's no other way to do so. I mean, the COVID-19 crisis teaches us, for example, that it's only with clear scientific protocol that you can sometimes tame the, the fears of people that face what they perceive as a danger or concern or worry. So that, that's why I'm saying the RGMPs are still very important addressing this, even if they actually do not address directly the issues of political acceptance of, of the, of, uh, by, by communities. There are ways to quantify this, and um, Terry, I'm happy to discuss this later with you, but there are very interesting ways to quantify the acceptance of a, of, of a project or not. Um, it has to be, I mean, anyway, it has to be folded up with obviously an integration understanding of creation of value around the territory. Uh, if anyone among the attendants wants to you know, get some more information, I would just encourage you to look at past uh, you know, coffee chats. We always send you the videos or put them on our LinkedIn page, but there's a lot of, of local content from last week that's on you know, community perception, that's on political risk, that's on criminal organization and impact on, on communities. So there's a lot of data that, that, that can be here. But what's, what's interesting is you know, if you complement those RGMPs, let's say with for example, we developed a toolkit of relation with communities together with the Canadian government and a former 
president of PDAC, PDAC. So there's, there's ways of addressing communities, of understanding how to build trust and so on. There would there indeed be a risk if a company believes that just with the RGMP, without engaging more on a qualitative social level community is going to solve everything obviously and i'm sure you know terry agrees with me that you know it's not by just saying look i got the lgmp label i don't have to interact with the community that you're going to solve the issue everybody understands that investors understand that also they know of the risk that can have with you know criminal organization maybe a a, a a very negative impact or delay on the license to operate of a project for environmental concerns all this so obviously yes the rgmps need to be also you know you know, complemented with an on the ground daily interaction with community, which is harder right now with, with COVID obviously, but can be supplemented also with third parties. And I don't want to preach for our own you know, work, but there's, there's a lot, we're happy to share this information of ways that this can be done, okay? But yes, uh, the issue of RGMP does provide this framework based on sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So therefore one that is you know, accepted by also opposition forces to the mining industry to try to find a common way and a common ground of moving forward for the creation, the value, the creation of values for the territory. Uh, and and there are ways where I'm mean, I'm happy to continue. We're gonna have plenty, surely plenty of conversation in the future with with Terry on this. I think the the elements of, thir of a third party assessment should maybe go a little further in terms of of acceptance with communities. I'm thinking about you know what Carlos is probably talking about because we work with Equarunaru, Pachacuti, Konaye, all the the indigenous communities against mining and try to understand their concerns so there needs to be probably an extra step but that is a very good first steps already from the from the world council and provide the basis for you know successful progress for mining companies and and, and look so and, and i just let me build on on that a little bit and talk to some uh, specific areas i mean free prior and informed consent is clearly a particular topic of, of issue in terms of engagement with communities and it's only one issue um we explicitly talked about the, the need for free prior and informed consent within the, within the RGMP. So I, I agree with you. I think that the RGMP set the bar high. Um, what we've also tried to do with them though, is set this as a universal level for every gold mining company needs to be operating at that level. Some companies will need to and decide it's appropriate to go in deeper in specific areas because those are the issues that are most material to them. Others will, uh, have, have other topics and one of the questions that I often get asked is where, where will gold mining companies find it most difficult to comply with the RGMPs and the answer is the classic it depends it really does depend on on, on your individual circumstances and for some community will be top of top of the list and and what they need to do to to gain that political acceptance and and, and demonstrate how they are engaging in a meaningful way for others, it, it will be other other topics, and and um, it, it would be disingenuous to say every gold mining company has the same set of of issues. That's not the case. Yeah, you, you make me smile because I always start in my my university classes. The first, I mean, you know, the first class when you say hi to everyone the same way. People were scared of my classes because there was a little bit of engineering, a lot of economics, you know, some numbers. And I said, don't worry, my class is very easy. I'm going to give you. The question to every single, the answer to every single question I'm going to be asking, even at the exam. And they were like, what? I said, yes, the answer is it depends. But now, good luck to know it depends on what and explain me where. I and mean, obviously, you can't replicate the, 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 the the guidelines. It's always a question of being able to implement it, understand the, the specific concept uh, and the, the concept, specific context that would, you know, demand a, a certain type of implementation, a certain timeline, a certain focus to specific stakeholders. I'm happy to to help anyone who wants to implement uh, those guidelines, but that's obviously the key to the success of it. But without those guidelines, you know, you can't have a strong uh, you know, perceptive based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals backed by the industry. So that's one side of the equation, let's be honest, Terry, but also, you know, understood, understood by different groups. And, and we probably, I'm, 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 I've been reaching out to different people that are not interested in, not, not really supporting by the mining industry so that they can discuss this. We're probably going to have, you know, further coffee chat, but that's by having this kind of roadmap in the middle for the conversation that people move forward. Um, I'm going to ask you one question, Terry, because we've got two questions that are very, very similar. Uh, one of them was 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 very positive and and just you know someone that really likes you, Jim Valentine. Actually, I know Jim. So uh, as a recent CEO of two gold producers, I can say that we're very lucky to have Terry to talk to us. The Volgo Council has had to manual our responsible coal mining. So that's the positive. And then one that was just sent to me that was asking, but do all the companies really have to, you know, are they obligated, as a term, to adhere to the RGMP that Terry has referred to? So let me just before you answer, don't be don't be shy, don't be afraid. I mean, Terry 
even if I'm French and he's in London, so I'm, his, I'm the historical nemesis that, uh, you know, of, of the country, he actually answers to all my questions. So go for it. That, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, no, very, very happy to answer. Look, there, there is absolutely, I mean, so uh, firstly, thank you. And, and look, I really hope that the responsible gold mining principles and indeed the rest of the work we do at the World Gold Council can help the entirety of the gold industry um, understand the contribution that this sector makes and think about how to continue to raise practices. And I say continue because there is so much work, good work that, that happens that sometimes we as a sector don't always talk about en enough. And it's not to say that there aren't issues and challenges. Of course there are. Um, and we've got to find the right way to, to address both. Uh, we've had lots of conversations with our board, again, CEOs of our member companies, and, and it's been complete agreement that conformance with the responsible gold mining principles is a condition of membership for the World Gold Council. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is as simple as, as that. Uh, there is a commitment from the industry, or at least from our members, to support and, and to really uh, demonstrate their commitment to responsible mining. Um, and I think that a lot of that comes from, uh, if you like, historically the sense of Okay, we are with varying degrees of, um, if you like, intensity, been working on different topics within that overall ESG. If you speak to any mining company, they will tell you that they've worked in thinking about any decent mining company. Health and safety has been ingrained into the way you think about things for 20 odd years, probably more than that. Environmental responsibility has also had a, a similarly long tenure. Um, some areas are, are getting more importance now, and I think it'd be fair to say probably areas around gender and diversity haven't always been as deeply rooted in, in gold mining companies and are increasingly coming to the fore. So part of this is around the industry saying, look, this isn't, we've just, this isn't new. It's not like we've just woken up and embraced the ESG revolution. These are things that we have been working on um, progressively. And we as an industry want to make it very clear that we are committed to responsible mining, period. Um, and, and that is why conformance with the RGMPs is a, is a membership condition. At the same time, uh, it does say that there is a recognition that uh, there are areas that need improvement and, and that we, we've, I think, been quite stretching in, in what we've set out and, and, and what the industry needs to do. So there's actually a three-year implementation timeline from the launch in September 2019 to full conformance and full implementation with external assurance. Um, and so and, until we get to that point, look, we, we, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. But very clearly, and, and this isn't just, um, th these were not lightly undertaken, that those decisions by our board that this should be a membership requirement. It is going to be uh, a fair amount of work fair amount of money spent both internally uh, and with external assurance providers. But I've spoken with a lot of our member companies and they're, and they're really proud of what they're doing. And look, you're seeing that in some of the reporting that's coming out now on sustainability reporting where companies are talking about their commitment to the RGMPs, um, even linking it to executive compensation. I mean, what, one comment, and first of all, the element of, of executive compensation is, is essential. <laughs> now you just open the gate for another hour of conversation, but I'll come back to it. Uh, but the question that I had and the comment that I wanted to make, and you mentioned something that is very important, which is um, the mining industry is very segmenting. Segmenting in the sense of people that usually work for the mining industry are mainly geologists, mining engineer. It's not such that there is a diverse population, but it's really much more people that are rooting into the hardcore science or geology and other, other elements. And when it comes to talking with communities, when it talks to social, political, sometimes anthropological elements, it's very far away from, from the sphere of comfort. And I feel that uh, initially the mining industry has gone through the classic, you know, ERM or the kind of companies that would, you know, kind of, of, of be able to really do a due diligence or analysis of, you know, environmental consequences and impact, and sometimes just use the same people to be able to talk about social political impact, you know, look a few pages on communities and so on. 
but it's really completely different. Like I can't tell you anything about water management. I can tell you water is wet. That's all I can tell you. But I can really tell you about you know social economics and relationship between communities and others. And when I talk to my you know my colleagues from more the environmental engineering side, they admit that this is really two things completely different. And we, and I think those RGMP principles are starting to really move you know together into that movement of understanding that there needs to be real specialization because if that is not taken seriously as a, as a as a topic by itself that with the real experts on that topic then we're going to continue seeing what we've been seeing for the last decade or so which is probably around 200 you know projects that are now halted in latin america a little less in africa on different levels of of, of development but that that's the key limitation to, to the sector i'd like to ask you one thing uh, and and we have this question a couple of times uh, uh, you mentioned that different mining companies were engaging differently with those rgmps obviously i'm not going to ask you names of who are the best mining companies or others maybe if you want to share them i'm okay uh, but there was there was a question also from vera tostado from the canadian embassy embassy in mexico city especially for junior miners and junior companies, uh, do they actually fit also into this process, and do they face different challenges that big companies obviously they, they do? But what what can you tell to anyone from the uh, Canadian Embassy in Mexico City that engages with junior miners in the gold sector of how they can actually mainstream those RGMPs inside their operations? Also, sure. So really important and and, and really important for us that. Um, and, and thank you, Remy, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this because we, we, we want to see um, adoption across the entirety of the gold mining sector. And I talked a little bit about our members before. I'm very conscious our members are tend to be the, the, the larger. We do have some smaller producers as well, but they, they tend to be the larger, um, well-established, well-capitalized businesses that, that put... Um, and have historically put a, a lot of effort and resource behind sustainability. What I would say is that the RGMPs are principle orientated, that as such, they should be able to apply to uh, all different types of gold mining, these large scale, um, they're not really intended for artisanal. Um, and I think I'd build on your point just now of the the recognition, and this has been there for a while, and I think it's just been more formalized in, in kind of, that, that to make a successful operation needs not just addressing the technical risks, but the non-technical risks as well, the, the, the social and, and the um, sustainability risks. And that particularly for juniors that are thinking about what one day, th how they, 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 their exit or what that might look like, um, there is increasing, as you know, due diligence from any larger mining company thinking about acquiring a, a potential um, junior or, or development project around how that company has managed its sustainability footprint. And that speaks right to the, the anthropologists. And I mean, I've, I've had lots of conversations with, with mining companies that say, look, we, we've got it all wrong. We, we said we send in the geologists first. Actually, we should send in the anthropologists first because that it's right at the beginning that you start to set expectations. Um, now, I, I would, again, encourage every company to take a look at this and, and figure out how this applies to them. It's not, we, we've deliberately done this in a principles-based way. It's not rules-based. It's not saying this is exactly what needs to happen. Um, and think about how you apply this. I think it's that the, the driver is, yes, doing the right thing, for your the communities and, and employees that you're engaged with, but also accessing capital over the, the near and long term. I have no doubt that um, the more you're able to demonstrate how you are conforming with the responsible gold mining principles, uh, that is going to open access to, to capital. And let me just touch on the first part of your question. Please. Different companies are looking at this in, in different ways. What, what I mean by that is, is twofold. One, it is principles and, and different companies do just think about principles in, in different ways. You can still have assurance on it, but it's a set of principles. The second is so much of what a, how a company does sort of implements and operationalizes the RGMPs will depend on what they have done to date. And different companies have just gone about that in, in different ways. So some people have dedicated sustainability teams that manage the whole process. Some people pull people in from different departments. Some companies are already following, I mean, every company is following sustainability practices to some extent. That's building off the, the laws and regulations that are already in place. There may be following some 
um, schemes. For example, if you've got financing from the IFC, you'll be following the IFC performance standards. If you're an ICM member, you'll be following the ICMM's uh, performance expectations. If you're a member of the Mining Association of Canada, you'll be following towards sustainable mining. Um, you might be a member of none of those and, and doing different things. Every company starts from a different perspective and in, in what their existing practices look like. And we are not saying you all need to implement this in exactly the same way you need to pull this person out or give this title or there is flexibility and there should be flexibility but ultimately there is a set of principles that we believe can apply to every gold mining company operating globally and that through this development process we've gone through we think and, and we'd love feedback but we think we've got a good product that can work for all types of gold mining companies. Oh, wonderful. I'm, I'm arriving to, to the you know, difficult moment where I have four very interesting questions. We just have five minutes. So let me just try to address two of those questions quickly and then ask you the All two. Right, we'll do this rapid fire. Let, let's go. Okay. Uh, so what does the World Gold Council do for artisanal miners? I think that was mentioned. It's not really focused on artisanal miners. It's much more for larger mining companies. However, on our experience to working with mining companies in their formalization processes, it is very important for uh, you know, f that the mining company shows a series of guidelines that then we can apply to the artisanal miners. It's part of the trust relationship. It's a way to show that it's not only for artisanal miners, the, mi the large mining company does it also. So it's also a very interesting guidelines that could be then adopted and probably we could help you, uh, Terry, on, on trying to see, and, and with some of our partners, I'm thinking of PACT, I see that we're connected also, you know, of, of trying to do something for artisanal miners. Second question, sorry, I'm just jumping on this. Uh, we, we looked at, uh, let me ask you a question, your turn. Uh, are GMPs applied to mining operations that are not only gold? I mean, I know, I know Norman asking the question is one of the great copper experts in, in Chile. So I assume he's talking about an operation where the Chile uh, copper was one of the materials, minerals and, and gold was there. Do they also apply to companies that actually work on polymetallic operations? So first, for the, on, on ASM, hugely important topic for this industry, an area we're paying attention to, um, an area where we're engaged in some of the global policy making dialogue around ASM. I mentioned the OECD earlier. You might have seen they put out a call to action from the multi stakeholder group around ASM. We're, we're part of that group and other initiatives like that. Also, in the responsible gold mining principles, as you noted earlier, there is a, a principle in there around large scale miners yeah. helping to formalize access to markets for yeah. responsible ASM. And that's, a, as far as I'm aware, is the first time that anybody has actually set out in, in writing that needs to be followed uh, a process for engagement around ASM. Now, clearly, it needs to be done in the right way, and that's really important. And there, there are lots of complexities about that. You know that better than I do. But it, it is in there, and it is part of these principles around that engagement with responsible ASM. Yeah, it, it is fundamental. If, if you guys are looking for best practices, just Google AMI, uh, mining, uh, Latin American mining risk. There's a white paper with a specific part on, on uh, ASM and formalizing. So you have plenty of information there. Quick question from Nora Fiorini. Uh, and then there's a second question afterwards. How does your principle compare with the responsible mining assurance standard? Do they overlap? Are both coordinating in, in some way? I know you mentioned other indexes at the very beginning of, the, of, the, of this coffee chat, but can you address specifically the responsible yes, mining assurance standard? Yes, and this answers the, the copper question as well. So we have de designed our principles to be focused on gold. That being said, I would say that somewhere in the region of 90 to 95 percent applies across all different minerals but we wanted to do something we are the world gold council we wanted to do something that that is focused on gold i was on a panel at, at pdac in february just really briefly where we talked about over time i would love to see there be convergence across these different standards and that, that it's that this sort of alphabet soup of different industry initiatives is simplified um, we're actively participating in some of those conversations. And I know most of the co-panelists with you at this PDAC event, that was a great uh, panel. We haven't talked about it, but I heard it from other others. The last question, which is probably the most important one, so you have less than a second, uh, minute to answer it. Uh, what is the role of stake or different stakeholders and investors in implementing uh, uh, those RGMPs? I and mean, we work specifically with regional stakeholders, sometimes not from the mining sphere to try to create some alliances and build a balance of power in favor of mining companies that are facing strong in strong position. I'm thinking about projects in Colombia, Peru, I mean, everywhere in the world, specific projects. But how can those RGMPs serve other stakeholders and, and investors? What is their role in trying to make sure that they are implemented? 
I'd go back to where I started. This is really designed to support sustained social and economic development wherever gold mining occurs. All stakeholders who are involved should be raising the RGMPs with any gold producer, with any junior looking at gold mining and go, look, this is best practice for responsible gold mining. Are you following it? Talk to me about how you are following it, or if you're not, why not? And it's gonna present you more challenges if you're not following it than if you are. Um, be, be, be part of that engagement approach to help support responsible gold mining, because that really does have the potential to bring benefits to everybody. Great guys, it's, it's noon in, in, uh, in New York, Miami, Toronto. It's 5 p.m. in, 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 uh, in London, so we're gonna leave. Terry, thank you very much for, for your time. I'm gonna let you go to the you know, closest pub or whatever you do under confinement. <laughs> if uh, if, if, if only, we're not there yet. And, and we'll look, get there. Everybody, to, to you, Remy, and everybody in the course, stay safe and, and look after yourselves. Very unusual times and, and uh, look, a lot to learn about how to manage uh, community safety effectively and, and for everybody on the call to, to manage yourselves effectively as well. Exactly. And please, guys, send any question you might have. My email is easily available. You can find it. Just send questions. I'm happy to follow up with you know, future coffee chats. Uh, this video will be uploaded as always and sent to anyone who requests it. We're here to share best practices and whatever we can do to help the community and, and value creation and sustainable mining practices. That's our role. So please let us know. Uh, Terry, it's a pleasure as always. Looking forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sitting in. Cheers.